My name is Roger Cochetti. I'm with the Computing Technology Industry Association, CompTIA. We're a computer industry trade association. And on behalf of the Congressional Internet Caucus, I'd like to welcome you all to our first panel discussion today. The subject of this panel discussion is global broadband rankings. Is the US falling behind or positioned to leap forward? Before talking a little bit about this panel um, and introducing, giving the, the participants to, an opportunity to introduce themselves, um, I wanted to offer a couple of background comments. Um, first, as someone who had the privilege of working with um, Jerry Berman, um, Rick White, Rick Boucher, Pat Leahy, uh, uh, Bob Goodlatte, and Conrad Burns at the beginning of the formation of the, of the Congressional Internet Caucus and the, um, the Internet Education Foundation, um, I'd like to take uh, a moment to thank them for the effort that they made in bringing us to where we are today. And also, in particular, uh, as, as Congressman Boucher said earlier, uh, Tim for the tireless work he's put into making the caucus and the, and the foundation um, a success, and his very capable colleagues, uh, uh, Danielle and Kyla, who made today's conference a, uh, the success that it is. So we all owe thanks to all of the team that made this happen. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Internet Education Foundation is the organization that works <coughs> behind the scenes to make the Congressional Internet Caucus uh, do what it does, including the State of the Net Conference, as well as uh, Get NetWise um, and uh, the activities of the, of, of the uh, um, caucus itself. Um, uh, for those who haven't taken the time, I would encourage you to take a few minutes and check out the uh, Internet Education Foundation. It is, in my judgment, one of the most important charitable organizations involved in the Internet and Internet policy these days. And any of you who have free money to contribute to it, it is tax, uh, it is tax exempt and, and we're always welcome for looking for support. Um, before asking our panelists to uh, introduce themselves, I wanted to say a little bit about the um, issue that we're discussing today. When the Congressional Internet Caucus was founded 10 years ago, um, there were lots of issues that um, everyone involved in it knew were going to be active, important issues in 2007. Um, content, privacy, spam, these are issues which have changed over the years but have been constant factors in dealing with the uh, policy structure surrounding the Internet. But one of the issues that I don't think anyone at that time uh, foresaw was the issue that we're here to discuss today, um, namely uh, broadband rankings. I think of this issue uh, as, uh, as the global warming issue of the Internet. Um, and, and I say that because it's a, it's a tremendously important issue, uh, not because of what you think about the issue itself, but because of the conclusions you reach after you've reached a conclusion about this issue, the direction you think governments or the United States government should take. So make no mistake that the debate or the discussion we're about to have this morning is not about uh, are the rankings valid or not valid, is the United States successful or not successful. Um, that is really just the appetizer. The main course is depending upon what conclusion you reach or what answer you provide or come up with that question, what do you do about it? Where do you go from there? So I think it's appropriate and, and um, wise to uh, begin today's discussion, uh, begin, begin the, the, the conference with a discussion of this, because coming out of this discussion, you will have a point of view that will affect almost everything else we're talking about uh, in, in the rest of the conference. That having been said, um, we've assembled what I think is a top-notch panel to discuss the issue, as, so, as you would uh, uh, expect for the, the sort of global warming issue of the Internet. Uh, these are people who have studied it, um, who have examined the facts, the statistics, uh, the trends, and have reached their own conclusions, and, and several of them have written widely about it. Um, so without any further delay, let me ask each of the panelists to introduce, to briefly introduce themselves, and then we're going to come back and, and have a, a conversation among the panelists. Um, I have one uh, request, uh, and, and that is I, I need a volunteer 
for somebody who is sitting in the front row who considers themselves punctual, who can raise their hand and let me know when it gets to be about 10 o'clock. Because at about 10 o'clock, we're going to go to uh, questions and answers and then quick wrap up. So Everybody's got to make their best effort to speak up. Speak okay. loudly. Speak, speak loudly, Tim is reminding me. So could one of you, someone in the front, thank you, sir. And if you'll just raise your hand when we hit 10 o'clock, everyone will know it's time to wrap up so we can get to uh, questions. Um, w w with that uh, background, um, why don't we just go right down the line and please introduce yourselves. Um, <coughs> loud. Right. I'm Scott Walston from the Progress and Freedom Foundation. If you want to give a little background. Want me to say more of that? Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I'm a senior fellow and director of communications policy studies there. Um, before that, I was at the uh, American Enterprise Institute and the AEI uh, Brookings Joint Center for Regulatory Studies. Uh, I have a PhD from Stanford University in economics, um, and I've written uh, quite a bit about uh, various aspects of telecom, um, international telecommunications reforms, privatization, competition, uh, broadband, um, and uh, a host of, host of other non-telecom issues. Thanks. My name is Taylor Reynolds. I work for the OECD, the Organization for Cooperation and Economic Development in Paris, France. Correct. It's a long name. It is uh, 30 member countries. It's an international organization with 30 member countries, um, market economies, the, the most developed market economies in the world. The U.S. is a member. Um, at the OECD, what we do is we gather statistics. I'm a telecom economist, so we, we gather statistics on telecom. We look for best practices, and we try and share those around among other countries. Uh, my name is Mark Lloyd. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. I'm a former journalist, and a, I'm not an economist. I'm a lawyer, so sorry to bring that conversation down a little bit. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Is it my turn? Yes. I'm George Ford. I'm the chief economist of the Phoenix Center. The Phoenix Center is a think tank here in Washington, D.C. that focuses on information technology, if you don't know. Uh, about the Phoenix Center, well, shame on you. You need to get caught up on uh, these issues and visit our website and download all our work. Uh, it's freely available uh, for download and discussion. Um, I am a PhD economist. I've worked for the Federal Communications Commission, MCI Communications, ZTEL Communications, which is a small CLEC in Florida. Uh, and now I am the chief economist of the Phoenix Center. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by asking each of the panelists in a minute or so to summarize what they think the debate is about. What is the issue? If we could get tried to, the, to educate the audience on sort of not the statistics or the facts, but what really is a, 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 the, the, the debate or the controversy um, that we're here to look at. And um, George, if you don't mind, we'll start with you and then work our way down okay, to this we'll end. Back with you. That's, that's fine. Uh, my, my issue on the, the broadband rankings, and I've been spending some time thinking about this a lot lately, is it seems to me that when, when broadband rankings are, are talked about that people check their intellect at the door. I don't know if you guys did that this morning. Um, for example, we have, uh, of course, President Bush saying that 10th uh, is 10 spots too low. Um, we had uh, recently uh, Commissioner Cobb saying that uh, something's gone terribly wrong because we're ranked 11th in one of the rankings. Uh, we move around a lot, I guess. And the issue is what, the question I have is what should we rank? Um, setting aside your patriotism or your fundamentalism or your nationalism or whatever it is, which seems to be the only thing that drives the issue, what should the U.S. be in its ranking? Uh, it's not obvious to me that, that zero is correct. Uh, or one, two, three, four, five, I don't know. Uh, related to that is, is how much is policy relevant to subscription? Is subscription driven by things like uh, income, uh, education, age, trade, uh, our consumption of telephone service? The U.S. is ranked 24th in the consumption of telephones in the OECD. Why should we be first in, in broadband connections? And the other issue is, is that rankings are entirely irrelevant. A okay, ranking is an order statistic. Okay, we could have everybody at 0 0.2999, 0 0.2998, 0 0.2997, such that everybody's essentially the same, certainly within the quality of the data, yet we could still rank those numbers. Or we could have people very far apart, and we still have a ranking, and the rankings could be one unit apart, where their subscriptions could be, you know, half 
the next guy up. Okay? If broadband subscription and use is the key to economic growth, and I think there's some evidence to support that, then it's subscription that's relevant, not rank. Rank is, a, is an exceedingly biased indicator of the role of broadband in uh, economic activity and growth. So generally, it's, just, it's A, why do we use rankings for anything? Uh, why do we speak about it with just complete you know, analytical absence? Uh, and secondly, does it really even matter? Is it an important statistic? And I, I would conclude uh, it is not. Mark. What is broadband? Um, the 1996 Telecommunications Act, Section 706, requires the Federal Communications Commission to report to Congress every two years on the state of deployment of advanced telecommunications technology. The FCC uh, satisfies this requirement by um, asking the telecommunications companies whether they are providing to one person within a zip code 200 kilobits per second in at least one direction. Uh, that might be advanced telecommunications technology in 1996. It is not advanced telecommunications technology in 2007. But that's what we're asking. And, that's, and the FCC zip code data which was complained about uh, as far back as 1998, is still being used. It is still the way the United States officially collects data about where broadband service is in the United States. In other words, we don't know. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we don't really know. Uh, the telecommunications companies may know uh, we have some idea where uh, DSL service might be. We have some, and again, might be. I, I lived in Cambridge for a very short bit of time. I was doing research uh, and, uh, and, and uh, teaching for some odd reason at MIT. Uh, I don't know why they need lawyers at MIT, but they, they invited <laughs> me to come along. Uh, and I wanted DSL service. Uh, and I uh, looked at the zip code. It seemed to be, it was going to be there. I could not get the DSL service in my home. Uh, it simply didn't reach to my home, which was across from the courthouse, the major courthouse in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, we don't know where broadband services are. Um, but if, if that's, if 200 kilobits per second uh, in, in one direction is broadband in the United States, uh, that's clearly not enough to provide the sort of two-way uh, video communication or heart monitoring that uh, Representative Boucher was talking about just a little while back. Uh, 200. Yes. Well, I, I was told that I should be patient and ignore the sort of <laughs> up and downs about the mics. I'm trying to do that. Um, so this is, this is part of the challenge. Um, uh, to that extent, I agree with the challenges about the rankings. Uh, but let me take my lawyer hat off and put my journalist hat on. The one utility about rankings is that it gets people's attention. <laughs> it's just, uh, that's why David Letterman is so popular. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we love top ten lists. We, I mean, it's just the notion of being able to understand where things are. Uh, the fact of the matter is we rank uh, college students. We, we rank, we, we always rank. We want to know where we are, and of course we want to be number one. The notion that somehow we started out as number one, but maybe 11 or number six, uh, I think is useful for us to sort of keep in mind. Uh, I look at the rankings and note, uh, I think, for me at least, it's most interesting that we are uh, fundamentally behind Canada uh, insofar as we're able to determine regarding both the um, speed of uh, broadband that's available to most Americans and regarding the cost of broadband that's available. Um, and that's, uh, that should not 
be. And so forget about the small islands with concentrated populations. We are behind Canada. Canada defines broadband services as five megabits per second. But they also argue, um, I think rationally, and, and I think as Congress intended, that broadband uh, or advanced telecommunication services, rather, ought to be judged based on the sort of services that you want, what's required to deliver those services, uh, and what's happening in terms of what's advanced at any given time. And with that, I think we'll stop. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm in an interesting position because I actually put together the broadband rankings. That, uh, <laughs> that's my job at the OECD. Uh, and in the OECD, the U.S. ranks 12th. So you might ask me, is that important? Does it matter if the U.S. is 12th or 13th or 11th or 10th? The answer probably is not that much. What is important, though, is where the U.S. stands globally and what kind of access and competition there is in the United States. I think that's where we're missing the point. It's not about if we move from 12th to 13th, are we a big country or a small country? What's important is what kind of access do we have at home here in the United States? Now, the OECD is based in Paris, France. And moving to France, I never would have guessed that broadband could be so good coming from the United States. But let me tell you the, let me tell you this, the service that I subscribe to. I get 20 megabits per second over ADSL. I get 100 television channels and I get free fixed line telephony to 28 countries, including the US and France, for $39 a month, for 29 euros a month. I was on the phone with someone just the other day, and they said, yeah, we're looking forward to a triple play package. I mean, imagine how great it will be to pay $100 and have video, voice, and data. I wanted to stop him and say, that's not great. I pay $30, just over $30 for video, voice, and data. Uh, interestingly, I, I'm kind of a broadband junkie, I have a, a DSL connection and a cable connection in my home uh, for redundancy, and <laughs> which I'm probably one of the few people in the world, but that's what's nice about infrastructure-based competition. Um, my cable connection is 30 megabits a second, and I pay roughly $23 a month for that. So for my total of 50 megabits per second, the video and the voice, I pay less than my parents pay here in the United States for six megabits of data connectivity. I think we need to look at, the issues we need to look at are penetration rates, but also speed. What kind of speeds are, are we getting here in the United States with our broadband connections? And how much are we paying for those connections? I think in terms of the, of the global broadband rankings, we should look at them not as where do we stand in a defensive position, but these are an opportunity. What are countries number one, two, three, four, and five doing that we can learn from? You know, that's where the focus should be. What has Korea done? What about Denmark? Why is the Netherlands leading in broadband penetration? Um, I, I think those are the types of issues we should look for so that we can boost our competitiveness. Thank you. Scott? Um, well, thanks. Uh, so one of the, the disadvantages of going last is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of it's been said already. Of course, the advantage is that I begin to get to reply to people. Um, so I, I, I think, I mean, George started off with it, uh, you know, on the, on the right note, I think, by, by saying that the rankings themselves, and everyone pretty much agreed with this, don't really mean much at all. We shouldn't pay, we shouldn't pay a lot of attention to them. I mean, we know that if, we, if we're trying to compare, um, if, you know, if you're do, trying to do any cross-country comparisons, you've got to control for a lot of things. You want to control for income and population density and so on and so on. So just the rankings themselves, are we 12th, are we 11th, are we 10th? It really, it, it just, it, it doesn't, you know, those aren't the things to focus on at all. Um, the things that we do want to focus on are, like we said, um, access and access and competition. And to that end, the real issues are what can we do to increase competition um, and and to to increase access in the market. Um, and I'll start with what I usually conclude with, uh, which is that you know we should still be focusing on um, bringing more spectrum into the market. So that that might be another way of delivering. Um, broadband access to people, if that's what, uh, if that, if there really is demand for that. And the second, um, another thing that's uh, that's sort of, well, it's been in the news recently is is franchise reform. And I wasn't going to talk about that except um, to note that uh, apparently one of the things that's so great about broadband in France is that you're allowed to get your TV channels over it. Now in the U.S., you're not allowed to do that right now. Um, although by by city by city, um, Verizon and, and AT&T are beginning to get uh, permission to do that. But another factor that affects broadband adoption, of course, is demand. 
and people don't like to talk about demand very much. People seem to think that if the technology is there, or I should say broadband junkies, and I, I include myself among those, although I don't have cable and DSL, although I'm kind of jealous that you do, but um, you know, p they, people seem to think that if the technology is possible, we must have it, and that's certainly not true. Um, some people just don't want and aren't willing to pay for the most advanced um, technologies. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S., more than any other country, I think, still have dial-up connections. And it's, to the extent that there are people who have dial-up and want broadband and can't get it, that's a policy problem. That's a problem. That's an issue. If they're willing to pay for it, they still can't get it. But a lot of people, and according to a recent Pew survey, have no interest. People who have dial-up have absolutely no interest in broadband. Obviously, that will change as content online increases and prices continue to come down. But some people just don't have the same taste for broadband that others do. And one reason that dial-up has stayed... Um, competitive, well, it's not exactly competitive, but that stayed um, uh, an option in the U.S. is because we have flat rate pricing. People can stay online for as long as they want. And so for some people, that's just enough. I know some people are right now thinking, how can you say that people should have dial-up? I'm not saying that people should have dial-up. Some people want it and are happy with it and have no interest in broadband. Now, coming back to the franchise issue, in countries that were allowed to provide TV service over broadband lines like France, like Japan, that was another reason why there would be for people to have extra demand for broadband, and it, um, and it, it again, furthers adoption and, and people's desire for it and increases people's willingness to pay. Um, we're beginning to get that here uh, slowly, and I think we'll begin to, to, to see the effects of that. Now, nobody knows whether this experiment by Verizon and AT&T is going to pay off for them, um, but it's another reason for people to want to get broadband. Um, and let me just say one more thing about the issue of statistics. Um, I think it's a great point that we, we don't really know, um, and that's true for the U.S. rankings, I mean, sorry, that's true for the U.S. statistics, and it's true for the you know, OECD statistics, it's true for the statistics from the International Telecommunications Union. Our FCC um, is actually very good at, I mean, there are a lot of problems with the zip code data, um, but they're very good at least at explaining their methodologies for how they collect it. Um, no offense, but we have no idea how the OECD, the OECD does it, um, and I would love to know more. But it's very hard to, it's very hard to get that information. Uh, and I, but the, the issue of statistics is one that a lot of people are working on and have a big interest in knowing because if we want to analyze this intellectually, we need to know what these, what these data mean and how, what, what broadband um, actually, actually is. And on the rankings themselves, uh, one, one, one thing they do is focus people's attention, but I think that that's not always a good thing. Um, I'm happy to see these issues getting attention, but it creates pressure for, for policymakers to do something immediately, right away, and to try all kinds of policies without any thought as to whether there's evidence that they're going to work. And instead, we should be focusing on, you know, are there barriers to entry? What can we do to increase competition? And those are the issues we should be focusing on. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Scott Broad uh, mentioned an issue in, in his comment, which um, I think is, is a fundamental issue, and it's one of those which really kind of determines how you go forward when you, when you look at this. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists if they would to comment on it. There are really sort of two statistics. Whether you do lists that compare the United States with other countries or not, there are two statistics that are relevant to this discussion. One is the availability of broadband, and the other is the penetration of broadband. Now, in modern societies and advanced societies, we look at both, and typically for different reasons. Um, we, don't, we, we don't talk about the availability of a high school degree. We talk about the, uh, no, the, the percentage of people who actually have graduated from high school. We don't talk about the availability of reading. We talk about the literacy rate. Um, in, in other things, however, we, we, we don't talk about, no one is interested in the usage level of things. Or to, uh, they're interested in the availability of services or things. So uh, the, 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 the issue of the metric that one uses, I think, is very telling in how one views this. And to put the question that I'd like each of the panelists to come in on in, in the extreme, if we said that we had universal availability of broadband in the United States, but very low penetration, uh, would, would we consider, uh, w w would we be satisfied with that? Or conversely, um, if we had a high degree of penetration with a low availability, which is possible if you sort of say the people who aren't getting it aren't getting it because it's not available, uh, uh, but the, everyone for whom it's available is, is, is subscribing or taking it up, would, would we consider ourselves, w w should we be satisfied as a nation with that? So if, if each of the panelists could, could comment, and Scott, since you touched on the issue, I'm going to ask you to comment on it and to sort of work the way in the panel down. Is the real issue here availability or is the real issue here penetration? Oh, but it's fun going last. 
Um, <laughs> Sorry, you get the, other people get the um, comment so, so on what you have to say. <laughs> on, on availability and penetration, right, those are two separate things that we, we look at in different ways. And the, on, on availability, it's, it is the FCC zip code data that sort of is a, an attempt to track that um, with, with all of its problems. That's tr an attempt to show where broadband is available. Um, and the number of subscribers is, is the penetration rate. Um, and so those are the, those are the two things we, uh, that, that we can look at, um, in addition, of course, to, to bandwidth or, or speed. Um, in terms of when you'd be satisfied, I mean, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, it seems that in, in any industry that is at all regulated, nobody's ever satisfied. Um, and of course, they, they wouldn't be. Companies have an interest in this, consumers have an interest, and they're all, if it's regulated, they're gonna be, they're gonna be lobbyists, um, and somebody's not gonna be satisfied. But, I mean, what I would look for, what I would want is to, um, is to, is, you know, evidence that a market is competitive, that there are low barriers to entry, that there are multiple firms competing for consumers, uh, and that you see that reflected in changes in prices and services, uh, and, and so on. And, and I believe we are seeing that, um, but I also believe that uh, that there is definitely scope for, for more competition. And I mean, I think we saw that in the recent AWS Spectrum auction uh, that raised, you know, that where firms spent, I think, about $14 billion or so for, for Spectrum. Some of that will be used for additional broadband services. And, you know, we'll see what happens in the upcoming 700 megahertz band auction. Um, there's clearly, companies at least perceive that there's definitely more demand um, for certain broadband services. Uh, and so that certainly suggests that there's, you know, there, there could and should be more, more entry. And so hopefully, um, I mean, that's what we should be working for. I'm sorry, Scott, I don't want to put um, a word in your mouth, but is that, is that your way of saying that availability is really your primary metric and uh, uh, penetration is your secondary metric? I, it, it, that's, that's a, it's a hard be? question to answer. I mean, on, on the one hand, you're asking, um, you know, another way of putting it possibly is, um, are we concerned more about supply or demand? Um, and I, I, you know, we're, 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 we're concerned about both. And what we want to know is that the supply and demand curves cross at an equilibrium point that's not just, you know, and, and there aren't distortions in the market. And where that point is, um, I, I, I have no idea. Keller? That's a very good, very good answer. Um, I, you know, I've, I've looked into um, some of the data here. I, I deal with data all the time. Uh, the OECD does report coverage for individual OECD country, uh, member countries. We see the coverage of DSL or the coverage of, of cable. Um, but really, we need to look at, at where demand and supply cross. Um, I think one thing that is important as well is that we need to go a step further than just saying, is broadband available in a certain zip code? Because I need to know how many operators are providing broadband in that zip code, which the FCC does supply. But I, just for kicks, I went and looked at, at my parents' zip code, the zip code where I grew up. And my parents' only choice for broadband is cable until about six months ago when Quest, who is their provider, came on with a DSL offer. So I looked up their zip code, and there were eight providers listed in that zip code. It said, well, broadband or internet services are available from eight providers. So if an economist coming in and looking at that would think, well, this is a competitive market. You know, one is better than two, uh, two is better than one, three is better than two, eight. This must be thriving. But really, my parents only had one choice for broadband for a long time. So it's availability, yes, I need to be able to get it from one provider, but availability is more. How many competitive operators are there in that market? You know, I, I mentioned uh, living in France. I have a choice of five or six ADSL providers that I actually connect in with, with their equipment in the exchange. So this is a, a fully unbundled local loop. I have five or six operators alone that I can choose from for broadband services. Um, and then I can go with cable and wireless. So, so is, I'm sorry, but is, are, is your answer both? Or do you primarily look at availability or primarily look at penetration? I think you have to look at them uh, together because you can't have high penetration without high availability. And um, the, the, the two just need to go together. Mark? Yeah, I would, I would say both as a, as a quick answer to the question as well. But I, again, I, I think we have a much more fundamental problem, and that is, again, that we're defining the FCC determines availability, uh, again, with the rate of 200 kilobits per second. Now, what was the what was the what was your well, the speed in, in Paris? Well, we get 20 megabits, but the OECD <laughs> does 256 kilobits. So yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is. I wouldn't call this broadband service, but, but this, is, this is what we know. 
I don't know how you can have an intelligent public policy discussion, uh, how you can encourage competition, how you can make sure the market is working if you don't know the facts. And we don't know the facts. We don't have the data. Despite the fact, again, that Congress has asked the FCC to collect the data, we still don't have the data. And I, how do you move from there? I mean, so we can sort of guess about rankings. <laughs> we can guess about, you know, maybe there's competition here or penetration. Maybe there's you know, pricing. But we don't have the data, despite the fact that Congress has asked the FCC to collect it. And so I think, as a, as a, again, the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that we have a clear definition of what advanced telecommunication services are in the United States. What is the rate? Is 256 KPBS in one direction sufficient? If that's not, where should it be? Should it be, you know, two megs? Should it be five? Let's define it, and then let's find out beyond zip code data where it is. Now, that, that begins to answer the availability question. The questions about um, penetration, uh, or what some of us think of as digital divide questions, or, uh, I think are also important. But I'd, again, I don't know how you get there <laughs> without the facts. I, I don't know how you have, again, an intelligent public policy discussion. In 2007, we are more than 10 years behind in, in understanding these set of issues without having the basic facts. It's just guesswork, and we shouldn't be engaged in guesswork here. We should know. George? Uh, I'll go from a, a slightly more practical perspective and say, uh, when, when a, if we're thinking about subscribership and we want subscribership to go up, which is, I think, the obvious point of the whole ranking debate, uh, there are two components. It's a sequential decision. The first thing a household has to have, or business, has to have access, okay? It has to be able to subscribe. And that's a question of availability. If, the, if, if able to subscribe, if it's uh, possible, then the question becomes, is the value of the service greater than the price they have to pay for the service? Okay. So when we come to a policy issue, the first thing any policy proposal should say, and I think the FCC should require it, is that, A, how does your policy proposal affect availability? Does it increase availability in areas where availability is not, or you don't have any availability? Second, how does it affect the value of the service? And third, how does it affect the price of the service? If you have a proposal, for example, I recently read a, a, a quote in the uh, franchising proceeding at the FCC, we're ranked 15th in broadband, uh, therefore we shouldn't grant franchise relief. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. If franchise relief does anything, it will expand availability, probably lower price, and probably increase the value of the service. Okay, so it's completely contradictory to any reasonable public policy proposal. Okay, so the issue, I mean, we're, they're, they're right. Supply and demand have to intersect, and we have to think about what the demand is in a country. But when we think about it from a policy perspective, we have to put our proposals into some kind of framework, and that framework is, does it increase availability, does it increase value, and does it lower price? Okay, it's got to do all of those or at least two of those, or one of those, I guess, without affecting the others in order to improve or to raise subscription. Okay? So if you can't prove your point on that, then just uh, then leave your filing at home and don't make, make us have to read it, please. Thank you. We are now going to turn to uh, questions from the audience. Um, what I would ask you to do if you have a question is raise your hand and wait for me to recognize you and a microphone to be brought to you before you do anything. Um, right over here, if you will stand up, a microphone will come over to you, and when it's there, if you will introduce yourself, and if your question is for all members of the panel, please say that. If it's for one member of the panel or specific members of the panel, panel please say that. Yes, please, again, introduce yourself, your name and your Thank affiliation. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan Michael, Member of Parliament from the UK. Um, some of us here have just been listening to the discussion in the panel. And we're a bit puzzled uh, because, frankly, it sounds as if this discussion is taking place in a bit of a time warp. Um, as described by the panel, it sounds as if the spread of broadband in the USA is being constrained by conservative incumbents that are constrained uh, by old-fashioned socialist system of the Universal Service Fund uh, directed at the provision of a service, which I think was the question that was being asked um, earlier on. 
Uh, and surely in the age of convergence and with the free flow of the internet, don't you need to move to a more free-flowing market approach? It sounds as if one of your speakers was suggesting that subsidy uh, improves competition, which uh, strikes us a bit, a bit odd. Haven't you looked at international best practice? Because frankly, we regard France as a bit backward. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I guess, uh, let me, uh, uh, tell her you had your hand up first, but any member of the panel could please comment on that. Oh, she's a member of parliament. Do we get the booing? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I yeah. have this. Th thank you very much for your comment. Um, and let me ask the panelists to keep your responses brief so we can get to yeah. the questions too. Just very quickly. Um, one of the things I think we need to do is we need to look at be best practices around the world. That's one of the reasons these statistics are important. We can say, you know, why is the UK doing well in broadband? What is working in the UK? Um, we look at Ofcom, some of the decisions by the regulator in the UK, very good. The structural separation, the accounting separation of BT, and BT's new approach with open reach. BT has this innovative way of thinking about networks. They've said, you know what, there's value in providing the network to anyone who wants it, and there's also value in providing services, but we don't have to stick the two together. So what they've done is they've separated out the, uh, the provision of the physical network from the services, and you can buy uh, it's, it's called open reach, and competitors can come in and use that, that portion of the line. And, and BT has just transformed itself that way. And I think this is something very interesting that the U.S. and other countries at the OECD should look at. I know that Aircom in, um, in Ireland is looking at this, uh, Telecom Italia in Italy. Um, there are proposals around about this sort of structural separation. I think this is also the push for municipal broadband, where you separate... Um, the provision of the physical infrastructure from the services. I think that's a debate that's going on here in the U.S. I think there are a lot of things we can learn from looking at our neighbors. Uh, Scott, yeah. yeah I, I, that's a, that's a, that was a, a great comment um, because uh, I at least certainly didn't want to give that, that impression. Um, one of the... We, well, let, me, let me take back... We, uh, what you were talking about here was sort of related to unbundling um, regulations. And in the U.S., we tried that to introduce competition in local telephony the, with the, under the uni regime. And um, it was pretty much a, a, a huge failure. It did not create additional facilities-based infrastructure, facilities-based investment. Um, and in the US, we've sort of been increasingly moving away from that. As we've been moving away from that, we've seen huge amounts of investment by the incumbent telephone companies, Verizon and AT&T, as I said, you know, basically almost you know, Verizon betting the company on, on their fiber optic rollout. Um, and so here, I think we've, we saw historically really bad effects of the unbundling regulations, um, and so far good effects uh, of the, uh, you know, of, of rolling those back. However, this is still a debate um, across uh, uh, globally, especially in Europe, and it's a big debate right now. Um, I've done some work on this. I, I have an empirical paper on the effects of unbundling policies on broadband, um, broadband investment. And what I've found is that um, very, very extreme um, uh, unbundling rules where basically you allow competitors complete total access to any part of the network that you want, that they want, um, has had negative effects on, on rollout. Um, but uh, other regulations that make sort of interconnection easier um, can have positive effects. And um, to, to me, that's sort of a sensible result because uh, you want to facilitate things that allow competition, such as interconnection. But if you allow um, competitors access to your network at regulated rates, that reduces the incentive to invest because you don't get to... Re I'm getting a big response yeah. here. Um, because, well, the one thing that's not debatable is that you reduce the returns to your investment um, because you don't get to reap those returns. That part, I think, is not debatable. The, the debatable part, then, is whether that reduces it enough that it actually lowers investment other than what they would. And that debate is still open in Europe, um, although I think we've, we've, more or less, uh, we've more or less closed it here. Um, let me just leave it at that. Can, can I just quickly respond? Yeah, no, it's very, very quickly. Just, just very quickly. Um, there, there is a lot of controversy regarding open, uh, local loop unbundling, and the OECD and the ITU provide a lot of this data that's used actually in these regressions, and we need better data. We need longer time series to really come to any sort of, of good conclusion about the effects of local loop unbundling. I will point out, though, that there are kind of, we're getting mixed messages from the market. Within the past uh, two months, there have been three providers in Paris alone that have announced fiber to the home rollouts. So that would be free, that would be neuf segetel, and France Telecom. Two of those providers are using local, unbundled local loops. So right now they have revenues coming in, which has allowed them actually, uh, as Scott refers to it, the stepping stone effect, or climbing up the ladder of investment. We are seeing some move towards infrastructure investment by 
uh, competitive carriers. On the other hand, it doesn't seem to have worked well here in the United States. I think we have to keep an open mind on this and say, well, we're not quite sure what's working. I wanted to make one more very quick point. Very quick, because George is waiting. No, okay, George, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, was, I was to say, you've hit on, uh, you've hit on a big issue, hit the sign of the core issue in the, in the United States, particularly at this point, and that is it's the political issue, and I don't think people on this panel necessarily tend towards the interventionist mentality, but we have one group of, of people who believe the market never works and one group of people who believe the market never fails. And that's where, the, where politics meets in this country. And so you've got one group of people saying we need to subsidize everything and regulate everything, and one group of people saying let's not subsidize anything and don't regulate anything. And the issue is, the great debate is, which is going to make things better? And I think that is the core, uh, the core argument today in this country about we want to be better, which, which process works better? Is it unbundling? Is it not unbundling? Is it uh, structural separation or not? I mean, all these things. And we can learn from other countries uh, to some extent, but in the end, it's the politics that are going to, and, the, and the court system in this country that's different from the politics and court systems in other countries that's going to drive it. And the court system uh, got unbundling in this country, uh, and I think to some extent weak, weak uh, policy at the FCC. Um, but is it, was it a bad thing? I mean, it's, you know, we've seen a lot of investment since we got rid of it, so it's hard to say. Let's move on to the next question. Is there another question? Um, the gentleman right there. Uh, Danielle didn't get to the gym this morning, so we're giving her a chance to get exercise. Uh, Art Brodsky from Public Knowledge. Um, first, I'd say to the right honorable gentleman that one of the uh, amazing sights in London wasn't necessarily the gherkin that I saw the last time I was there, but a billboard in the tubes which advertised a company called B selling 24 megs for 24 pounds. So I think you are on the right track. And so that um, leads my question to Taylor. And um, following up on some of the others, what is it about um, the systems in the UK and some of the OECD countries that um, appear to produce better results, at least in terms of availability and price, than we have here? And is it your at least anecdotal experience that folks in those countries seem to value uh, or do, do, folks, do people in those countries value broadband uh, more or do they value broadband less than we value it here? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, the U.S. has taken a slightly different path than most of the countries in the OECD. Um, most of the countries in the OECD have, have moved down one direction, but the U.S. has, has moved down another and it's not saying one is correct or one is incorrect. I think what we need to do is we, we need to work within the, the confines of whichever policy the individual country has taken. Um, what it all boils down to, though, is competition. If you ask why does B offer 24 megabits for 24 pounds, it's because there's, there's strong competition in the British market. And what we, what we all agree on here is the more competition you have, the more people trying to sell you services, the better off you are. In the end, it doesn't matter. I, as a consumer, I don't care how many wire lines are coming into my home. I, well, yeah, I do. But, you know, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but as a, as a consumer, I don't consume broadband lines. I consume services over those lines. So what we really need to do is, as, as policymakers, we need to find out how do we improve competition and how do we improve the availability of services from multiple providers. And I think we can look to, to countries in Europe. We can look to countries in Asia. I also think they have things they can learn from looking into the United States. That's one of the nice things about the OECD is we look for things that work, and we try and share them with other countries. Um, I'd like to follow on that. I agree completely with, with, with that. I mean, competition is always competition is the issue. Um, but a couple of things. One, on looking at countries' best practices. That in itself is, is very difficult because you can almost always find an example of whatever it is you're trying to prove. So, you know, so France is doing well with unbundling. Korea got to the top of the rankings without any unbundling at all until 2002, at which point it actually seems to have started slipping a little bit. Um, and so what do we learn from that? I have, no, I have no idea. From what I just said, we learned nothing because we have two examples of exactly the opposite things. And so what we need is a more rigorous work on this question to see whether policies make a difference. And this, again, comes back to the data issue because um, it's very, very hard to, I mean, we're doing the best with the data we have, but we do need better data um, to better understand the impacts of policies and generate more good empirical work on it. Um, now, 
just in a, another defense of the FCC, though, um, I mean, this is a global issue. It's not just the U.S. I mean, the, the data doesn't exist really anywhere in a good form. Um, and uh, now to, to, to the defense of the FCC, it is a hard problem to solve. If you're not going to do zip codes, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to every single address and ask how many providers you have? How are you going to find the geographic area that you're looking at? Um, I mean, these are problems that can be solved. Um, but it's not like, you know, it's, it's not fair to say, oh, these people at the FCC are idiots. They don't know what they're doing because it's a really hard problem. Um, and, but we absolutely do need to, to work on it um, yeah, if we want to get good answers to these and, questions. And, and you know, the FCC produces one of the most detailed, best reports on broadband that you'll find anywhere across the OECD. Their, their reports on high-speed internet access are fantastic. So it's, I mean, it's part of this, what we need to do is we need to coordinate data. And we need to harmonize data across the OECD to compare. So. It's fantastic data, but it's completely inaccurate. Yeah. I mean, these are, <laughs> these, 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 <laughs> <laughs> the, these, these statements cannot be put together rationally. Uh, we, we can figure out where we've got broadband services once we define what broadband services are in this country. It seems to me that we're smart enough to do that. We, we haven't done that, and there are reasons we haven't done that. Um, f first of all, the notions of data become uh, obscure. They seem technical. Uh, they're not quite as interesting as just sort of a ranking. Going into methodology isn't really all that sexy, right? But uh, you have these high-level conversations about things without having the basic facts. And that's where we are right now. I mean, we, we don't know. And it's not because we can't know. We do a census on a regular basis. We do a current population survey on a regular basis to find out where things are in this country. You don't have to use zip codes. You can use congressional districts. How, how about that? I mean, there are a wide variety of things that you can use. We don't do that. We ask the companies, are you providing one person in a zip code? In Montana, zip codes can be a pretty large area. One person in a zip code, 200 kilobits per second in one direction. That's what we're asking. That's the data that we've got. That data doesn't tell me anything about how we stand with other countries, where, how we stand vis-a-vis -vis 10 years ago. We, have, we don't know. And the first thing we should do is to make sure we know. We should not let the FCC or anybody else, whether they're Democrats or Republicans or left or right or believe in the market or don't believe in the market, off the hook until we get the data. I don't want to be an FCC apologist, <laughs> um, but we, you know, we, we, we do learn, first of all, we, we don't know where the U.S. stands in part because we don't know what the data in the other countries means. Um, secondly, it actually does tell us what, where we were relative to 10 years ago. That's what it is good for, is you can, it gives you a, a sense of a trend. I wouldn't, you know, if, if, it's, if it says that there are eight providers in a zip code, yeah, I wouldn't take that to mean that you have a choice of eight people. But, you know, when you look at, it, at the availability over time, it does give you a sense of whether things are going in the right or wrong direction. So to say that it's completely without content isn't true. Um, and so, you know, and, oh, and, and also, in their most recent report, they started um, reporting who has uh, 2.5 uh, megabits per second in each direction. So they're moving. George. I would, I, would, I would say we need to exercise a little bit of caution as well as we look across countries in, this, in a static, you know, one period since. Uh, I remember back in the early days after the 96 Act, I'd travel to Europe and we'd be at a conference and everybody was talking about how great things were in the United States. And there was all these DLEX out there and all these DLEX out there. And not a one of them had a business plan. Um, just because somebody is offering you something for $24 doesn't mean they're going to make any money doing it or they're going to be around five years from now. And we have to stop and look, are these guys making any money? I mean, just because I want to do something. We learn in this country, if you, if you didn't see that, now the one thing we learned from the 96 Act is that people will waste money, and they will spend gobs and gobs and gobs of money for nothing. I mean, we were, in, a, in our SELEC business, we were going to buy some switches from a SELEC. We deployed 13 switches in this country. These were nice switches capable of really good DSL. Never had a customer. Never had a customer. We had other CLECs that had some great equipment, uh, invented equipment to, to run fiber through sewers. Never a single customer. Spent millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. So, I mean, it's, certainly we want to look at other countries and say, yeah, the prices are good in these countries. But you've got to stop and think a minute. Is this a viable industry equilibrium? Okay, is this something that's going to sustain itself? 
Um, and, and that's a, a, a fairly important question. You can't get too static in your mentality. You have to think about this thing over time, look historically, and try to look forward to see how things are going to pan out. Let me uh, uh, ask, I'm sorry, we are, we are at the end of a time for questions. I want to give each of the panelists uh, a minute or so to sort of wrap up. Um, uh, all of the panelists uh, are, are available for questions after the program, though, so please feel free to follow up with them. Um, but I, I'd, like, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to, to uh, conclude in a, a minute or two, but also ask you each to touch on one very important topic which we haven't much discussed today. And that is, since our host is the Congressional Internet Caucus, and since at the end of the day, the issue that they're concerned with is what can or should the federal government do? Uh, not what, you know, the, the, the issue that they must address is what, if anything, should the, the, the government do about the, the circumstances? And since I think all of the panelists have agreed that availability, penetration, and competition are three goals regardless of where you're, you know, uh, 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 statistically what you would aim for, that these are metrics we should look at. I, I guess the issue then is, if those are where we should be looking, is there anything that the federal government should do? And if there is, what should the federal government do about any or all of them? So with that question, um, I'm going to begin with Scott and ask him to begin uh, to, to, to comment on that, and as well as any other general comments, and we'll work for to George. Right, so the, the key point um, is the actual level of competition, uh, not the, the rankings, because as we've discussed, it, it's, it's not unclear what they even mean um, at all. At all. Uh, and so what Congress should do um, is, first of all, not get taken in by these, by these numbers. Um, the next time somebody says the U.S. is 12th in broadband rankings, you know, broadband, just, you know, forget that. Just it, it's, it's completely, um, well, you can pay well, attention to the numbers. No, no, that's right. Um, but, you know, it's, we, what we need to do is, is we need to get Taylor to work on more, more data. And, um, the, the point is to focus on competition. And what Congress should look and see, try to determine whether there are barriers to entry in markets. Um, and what are there, are there, in particular, are there regulatory barriers to entry? Are there things that Congress can do to remove those barriers to entry? And what Congress should not do is look for sort of active things that it can try to push broadband. Um, I think that would be a really bad idea. Uh, Congress loves to do things that involve, you know, cutting ribbons and you don't want to build something that people can point to. Don't do that stuff. I mean, don't do those sexy things. Do the really boring things. Look, look for ways to eliminate barriers to entry if there are any and do it intelligently. Don't do something that's going to try to generate some kind of quick fix because this is a market that evolves <coughs> very, very quickly. We're in it for the long run. Um, and so let's make very, very sure that any policies that, were, that are proposed are thought through very, very carefully and go through very rigorous analysis. Um, and you know, I guess the point about not being sucked in by the, by the rankings is to, you know, the rankings don't say do something, do anything. You know, they say let's just think about it and be very, very cautious about what we do. Keller, okay. I know you are an international well, civil servant, but you're here today as an American. I'm, I'm here as an American. I think it would be a mistake to, to blow off the, the rankings. Um, I would, I would disagree with that, not just because it's my job, but because there is some valuable information in there. And as economists all understand, we're all about digging for information and nuggets, gold nuggets inside information. Use the rankings. Look at the countries that are sitting at the top. Say, why is the Netherlands number one and number two in broadband all the time? You know, is KPN, their incumbent provider, doing something interesting that we could adopt here in the United States? KPN has announced again the same way as BT, that they're interested in providing wholesale access to the physical network and services on the other side. You know, look at these types of things. They may be appropriate for the U.S., they may not, but, but use those countries right towards the top to see if there's some information that we can glean from those. Um, I agree with Scott in terms of we need to find ways to improve infrastructure rollout. The U.S. has, has decided a, a path which is infrastructure-based competition. We want multiple fiber lines to individual households. So now we have the task of coming up, how are, we, how are we going to do that best? How can we facilitate the rollout of fiber to the home? What about the use of open access networks? Do we need to have multiple fibers? Or could we have one provider offering open access via a utility that all the providers could use? Or is it more important for us to have multiple fibers? These are the types of issues I think they should look at. Um, what about utility companies? Should utility companies be allowed to be in the broadband business? 
I think this is an important question that we need to look at because the number one uh, broadband country in the world right now is Denmark in terms of penetration. It's got um, 30 subscribers per 100 inhabitants. And a lot of those are now starting to come on via fiber to the home rollouts via uh, utility companies. So interesting things I think we can learn. Um, um, I, I think that would pretty much sum it up. We, we just need to look at ways to improve infrastructure-based competition now that that is the course that the U.S. has decided. Mark? I don't, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised at all about what I'm going to say, which, <laughs> which is that the first thing that I think Congress should do is to require the FCC to do a much better job of collecting information about where broadband services are, about defining broadband up from 200 kilobits per second to something that is a little bit more advanced. It might actually be advanced 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, the standard that we're defining now is simply not adequate. Um, Congress can do those things. Uh, I, I think you build public policy from the data. I think the data that we've got is extraordinarily questionable, at least. Um, and I think beyond that, I think restoring um, our um, restoring our federal entities that define standards that push scientific advancement in a way that actually will lead to innovation, to, um, to a clear use and utility for broadband services in our elementary schools and in our hospitals. And, uh, and among private businesses and among nonprofit organizations as well. I think we need to do a much better job. Now, whether that means restoring the old technology opportunity program uh, at uh, NTIA or you know, giving more money to the National Science Foundation, or w whatever it is, we need to find a way to put a much more money into investing in research and using the services that we've got to help generate greater competition. But again, the first thing, we've, we've got to get much, much better data than we've got now. George? Well, I have to admit to being a little disappointed. I thought the idea that, that it, uh, saying that where the US ranked was irrelevant would be controversial. Uh, but I think we kind of all agreed. I mean, uh, Taylor is basically saying we need to look at countries with very high subscription. Rank sort of gets you up to the top. But we could throw away rank and just say, who's got the highest subscription. Uh, but whether or not the U.S. is 10, 12, 13, 9, whatever, is probably not very important. And I think everybody kind of agreed to that. Uh, and on the encouraging side, I think we should propose legislation to legalize prostitution and drugs so we can be more like the Netherlands. Um, uh, that, that may be an important uh, policy. I don't know. Um, but, on the, but really, I mean, ser in, in all seriousness, I think Congress should, should, just like I proposed for the FCC, I should, Congress should have the same, should same, the same set of rules. When you propose something for broadband policy, you should A, show that it improves, increases availability, B, it increases the value of the service, or C, it lowers the price. I mean, you could take two things. Uh, franchise reform. Okay, franchise reform, in, in our own research, increases availability, probably increases value, and probably lower, lowers price. Okay, three good things. But we got that all tied up, and it killed it in Congress with network neutrality, which I think pretty much everybody would agree does all things opposite. It probably reduces availability by increasing the cost of the network. It may, you could argue it increases value, but I would argue that a, that a monopolist probably would not allow that to happen. He would make the same decisions on the value front. So that's, and it probably raises price by increasing cost and reducing competition. So there are two examples of, of, of good things getting messed up with bad things and getting, getting a nothing result uh, and having to go to the states uh, basically to get the result that we want and, and to the FCC. So we should, we should exercise discipline, and we rarely do that in, in communications policy. People should have to adhere to some kind of framework, and the FCC is partly to blame for not putting one out there. But we, you should have to adhere to a framework. You should have to say, here's how it improves things. Not just this is what I want because I want it, and by the way, we rank 15, which is irrelevant. Thank you. Uh, let me thank all of you for joining this conversation, and, and please join me thanking for the, uh, the panelists for uh, helping inform all of us.